take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter 15 today, Exodus chapter 15, as we're talking about the power of praise, the power of praise. You know, I got so excited baptizing those boys a few minutes ago, I I forgot to talk about their family for just a minute. So their family has rich roots in our church that go back several generations. And just to help you understand, Amber, wave Amber, is their mom. Joe is their grandmother. I know you hate to say grandmother, but it is. It is what it is, Joe. We've been around that long, okay? All right. And Marilyn's their great-grandmother. Hey, Marilyn. Marilyn Chambers, there she is. So I'm not going to ask you to stand, but if you are family or friends that are here specifically for the baptism, would you just wave real big so everybody can see? Great. Good, good. Thank you so much. We are so excited to have you with us today. I see Muffy back there as well. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank all of you for being with us today as we worship the Lord and as we talk about the power of praise, the power of praise. I read about a guy that decided he wanted to set the world record for sailing around the world in a hot air balloon. Have you ever been in a hot air balloon? I have never been in a hot air balloon, and I don't think I want to go because you can't steer a hot air balloon. Y'all know that? That it's steered by the winds, and so... You can get up to a certain height and, and catch the crosswinds. You can lower. Uh, but he started out in St. Louis and he was sailing at 25,000 feet in a hot air balloon. And he got as far as Africa when he figured out that he was headed straight for Libya. And it was against the law for anyone to fly through their airspace. So he was destined to be shot down by the Libyan army. So he's doing the best he can to avoid that. So he drops down to about 6,000 feet and catches a crosswind and sails this way, and then he he raises up and sails that way for a little bit. So he was able to get around uh, Libya without being shot down, but that was where his travels ended, was in Africa. He didn't make it all the way around the world. So when I was reading that illustration and the person who shared it, he talked about how that, um, he talked about how you're a prisoner of the wind. You're a prisoner of the wind when you're in a hot air balloon. Now, that was a captivating praise for me because I know a lot of people that are prisoners of their circumstance. They're prisoners of what they're going through, or at least they feel like they are. And the only way you're ever going to change your altitude in that circumstance is to change your attitude about it. And God wants to change your attitude about it by praising him. And so instead of looking at what's going on or what's happening to you, look up. And look to Him and begin to praise Him. And praise has a way of changing your perspective about what you're experiencing. And sometimes it can even change what you're experiencing. God can change the circumstance. Do you believe that? You're not stuck in where you are and your life doesn't always have to be that way. God can change it. God can deliver you. God can redirect your life by the power of His grace. And so the the Israelites experienced that as they came out of Egyptian slavery and into the wilderness to worship the Lord. And we're going to pick up our reading there in Exodus chapter 15 and verse uh, verse 1. Exodus 15, 1. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he cast into the sea. And the choicest of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemies. And in the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You send forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters were piled up. The flowing waters stood up like a heap. The deeps were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be gratified against them. I will draw up my sword, and my hand will destroy them. You blew your wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Verse 11. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? 
Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them up. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard, they trembled. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, uh, grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone. Until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased. Now look at verse 17. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea. And the Lord brought back the waters of the sea on them. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this song of praise that Moses and the men sang to you as they came out of Egypt. They'd been in slavery for so long, and you delivered them by your miraculous power. God, we thank you that you're the same today as you were back then, and there is nothing impossible with you. And so we lift our eyes from whatever we're struggling with or burdened with or shackled by, and we focus on you today to worship you and to praise you because you are worthy to be worshipped. God, you're worthy of the praise of the angels who have never sinned, and yet you love the praise of those who have been saved, who have been redeemed by you. And so we sing the song of the redeemed today as we praise you for your goodness and your grace, for giving us Jesus, our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the people of Israel learn something about praising God. And there are three points. You know, a preacher's always got to have three points. I don't have a poem today, but I got three points. And the first thing I want you to see that I think that they would say to us about the power of praise is that we need to praise God for his strength. Praise God for his strength. Because he, he says in this song over and over again that God is a powerful God. And there is no one like him. He is so powerful. Now, we know what praise is, and we shouldn't act like it's something foreign to us. I bet every time you go to an athletic event, you praise in some way. If you go to a football game, I know I'm, I'm tiptoeing into dangerous territory here, but if you go to a football game and some player makes an acrobatic catch in the end zone that wins the ball game, I bet you praise just a little bit. You probably come up out of your seat and say, Wow, what a catch! I can't believe it! What a great player he is! That's praise. That's praise. You're praising that person for what they've done. And so we come into this place to praise God. We don't come here to sing songs. We don't come here to preach sermons necessarily. We, we don't come here to take up an offering. Now, we do all of those things. We come here to praise the Lord, to worship God the Lord. And what we do here is just practice for all eternity. You know that, don't you? When we get to heaven, we're going to be praising God. We sang about that just a moment ago. We're going to be praising Him forever and ever and ever. So let's start by praising Him for the strength that He has and the strength that He has displayed in our lives. They came out of the Red Sea. The Bible says that God blew an east wind and it parted those waters. And the people of Israel walked through the, the Egyptian soldiers said, well, we're just going to follow them and we're going to kill them. We're going to take everything they've got. We're going to enjoy the spoils, they said in that song. And so they, the army got in the middle of the sea and God closed the waters back on them and drowned those Egyptian soldiers. And as their bodies are washing up on the shore, uh, it's sad, but it's comical at the same time, how God displayed his mighty power on behalf of his people to protect them and deliver them at just the right time. And so in that, in, that, in that moment, Moses looks back across the water and thinking about what God has done, he just breaks out in praise to God. You ever do that? 
You just break out and praise to God. Just think, you're going down the road, you start thinking about how blessed you are and how good God is. Or maybe you're cooking breakfast. Or maybe you're making the bed. Or, or maybe you're typing a term paper. I don't know. Whatever you're doing, you start thinking about that God is good and that he has displayed his strength in my life. And I want to praise him for that. That's what Moses did. And so that's what I just read, this song of praise. Moses did it, and all the men joined in with him, and they started singing about God's character, singing about the promises that God had fulfilled, singing about how God had worked miracles in their life, and they sang. They sang to God. They sang about God. They sang with each other. It says in verse 2, The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. I think it would do well if we would read that together. Y'all think if we do that together? I think we should read that together. So follow me as best you can. I know I'm hard to follow sometimes, but let's do it. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He is God in my life because he has displayed his wonderful power. Now, as they're praising him, they're reflecting an intimate relationship with him. The scripture says that they used his personal name, Lord, which is often in all caps, L-O-R-D, the personal name of God, 12 times in this passage. I counted them. I went back and looked at them in this chapter. 12 times they refer to God in his personal name, so they know him. Moses praised him because he's displayed his power. He says he's a warrior. He's the one who's fought on behalf of us. 285 times in the Old Testament, God is called Jehovah Sabaoth. And that is translated, the Lord God of the hosts. The God of the hosts. That term is used in the book of James. It's used in the book of Revelation as well, where it talks about God is the God of the hosts. Well, who are these hosts? He's not talking about hospitality. He's talking about a great army. Who is this army? He's talking about the army of heaven, all the legions of angels that God has at his disposal. God is in power. He's in control of all of those. And then with his powerful breath, I love the way he despise, uh, des uh, describes this. It's as though God just said, Whew. God just blew one good time. And the waters of the Red Sea parted and made dry ground for the Israelites to walk on. And with that same breath, he withdrew the wind, and the waters came back at just the right time. Isn't that an interesting coincidence that the water came back at just the right time to drown those soldiers that were chasing after them? Psalm 21 and verse 13 says, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise you for your power. God is a powerful God. Now, has God worked powerfully in your life? Has God done something powerful in your life? He has in mine so many times. Now, I've seen a lot of advertisements lately for electric cars. Have y'all seen those? The electric cars. Are you ready to buy one? You, you may have one already. I don't know. But one of the questions, the burning questions I have is about how much power does an electric car really have? And as I was doing some research on it, what I found out was that because I want to know how far I can go on a charge. I don't want to get way, way off out in Mississippi somewhere uh, where I don't have any cell phone coverage. I mean, that happens in Alabama, too, in several places. But I don't want to get somewhere where I don't have any coverage and my battery die, and I can't, can't get out of that, okay? So the average trip is about 250 miles on an eight-hour charge, and after 250 miles, you got to stop and, and charge it. That, that's what I found when I was doing some research on it. And so I'm thinking about the, the love affair that Americans have with the open road. Oh, we just, you know, you know what started the interstate highway system 100 years ago was our love affair with driving and traveling all over this country. And so Charlotte and I were having this conversation a couple of weeks back. I said, honey, we're going to have to limit how far we can go, you know. And we can't just get in the car and just go all day long because you, you run out of power. You say, now, wait a minute, brother. I know there are cars that go further than 250 miles. You're right. I did some research, and what I found was that there is a car, or a few cars, that will go over 500 miles on a charge, but they'll cost you over $150,000. 
I don't have $150,000. I don't know if I have enough to buy the other one either. So my main concern about that whole thing is running out of power. I'm concerned about that. I'm sure I'll get over it. It's just a phobia that I have. I'll get over it eventually. I never have to worry about God running out of power. I never have to worry about praying and, and asking him to help me with something I just can't fix or I can't advance or I can't solve. And, and knowing that he's going to say, well, I'm sorry, I've got to take a nap. I, I'm just tired right now. I've had too many people talking to me about things and I, I can't take any more no, God is always available. He's always ready. He's always able to help us if we will but call upon him. And look what he said in verse 11. Majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders. Do you know that when God works, it is a miracle? We say, you know, I, that, that was a God thing or, or, you know, I'm just praying for a miracle today. Let me tell you something. God doesn't do anything but miracles. That's all he does because he's not ordinary. He, he's not an ordinary being. And so everything he does is extraordinary. And when he works, he displays his power so that we would in turn praise him and give him glory. And so Moses did in verse 18. He said, the Lord shall reign forever." And ever, You know, that's the, the song that will echo throughout all eternity in heaven, that, that the Lord shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. We're praising him because of his great strength, his power. Well, here's the second thing that I see that they would probably tell us is that we need to praise God with another's song. Because the song of Moses is not the only song in this chapter. What we're going to see is that Moses' sister, Miriam, takes up the charge and begins to sing and praise the Lord. And the other women join in with her. Look at verse 20. Miriam, the prophetess, Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted the horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. So here we see Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron, is also singing praise to the Lord, and the women are joining in with her as she's praising the Lord. The, the, the Bible just simply says in verse 20 that she is the prophetess. So the, the Scripture is very clear here that Miriam was a preacher of the good news of God, that she was a preacher, and there are other preachers in the in the. Uh, the Bible as well. Verses 20 through 21, as we read, she's referred to as the sister of Aaron. You know, we believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. So he's writing about his sister here. I'm not exactly sure why he doesn't say, my sister Miriam did this. He said, the sister of Aaron did this. He might have said it because Aaron's the great high priest and say, oh, we can't touch the great high priest. Okay. Well, granted, God has a calling for people who serve as pastors, and, and I believe that those are men. But just because God calls us as pastors doesn't mean there isn't room for others to serve. And here specifically it names Miriam, the sister of Moses and Aaron. So there's no jealousy on Moses' part. And that's, he could have just glossed over this and not even mentioned it. This has become holy scripture for all eternity. The scripture says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And so for all eternity, we have a record of, of Miriam leading the women in praise to the Lord God. There's no jealousy of her. Um, he, he certainly was proud of her. After all, she was the one that saved his skin when he was a baby, remember? <laughs> uh, put him in the bulrushes and watched over him until the princess came and found him there and, and saved him as well. Miriam is leading the women and praising the Lord. Not only that, okay, Baptist, you need to buckle up for this. The Bible says they were dancing. <gasps> I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. You know, they, they were dancing. I mean, they just let their hair hang down. I mean, they just had a great time. They, they're praising the Lord. There, there's a sense of lack of constraint in some ways as they're in the presence of God and thinking about how God has saved them and they begin to praise the Lord. They're praising the Lord. You say, Pastor, why are you mentioning this? Because uh, here, here's one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this. 
How one person praises the Lord is going to be different from how you praise the Lord. And how they praise the Lord is not necessarily bad or wrong because they don't praise the Lord the same way that you do. We just need to get over ourselves, all right? We just need to get over ourselves and just welcome the, into the family of God those who claim the name of Jesus. And granted, we congregate uh, the principle of homogeneity. Uh, we, we, principle on, uh, we gather on the principle of those that are like us we're most comfortable with. I understand that. But that doesn't mean that we should look down our noses or reject others who worship God a little bit differently from us. If they name the name of Jesus, can I get a witness? Because you're going to be in heaven with those people for all eternity. And you better be worshiping with them now as much as you can because you will later, forever and ever. We praise the Lord, but we praise Him with others, with another song. Now, every football team has something that we need in the church more of, and that's a cheerleader. You watch the cheerleaders? You ever watch? I just watch the cheerleaders sometimes. I just watch them. I like to watch them. Man, they're acrobatic. They're flipping each other, doing all these kinds of things. But a cheerleader, you know what their job is? A cheerleader's job is to praise the people who are playing on the field and encourage the crowd to do the same thing. And cheerleaders, sometimes I think they're not rational. They're not reasonable. They're, are, are you living in reality? What? Why are, why are you still cheering? We're losing 50 to zip. I mean, what's going on here? And they just keep saying, rah, 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 we can do it, we can do it. Every church needs some people like that because we have people that come to worship that are busted and broken and burdened and they don't know what to do with their life. And they need somebody that will meet them and just say, hey, it's going to be great. Let's praise the Lord today and God's going to help you with whatever you're struggling with. Come on in, come on in. Praise Him with another's song. Colossians 1.3, Paul said, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. He wasn't with them, but he said, We are praising the Lord. We praise the Lord together. Now, here's my last point, and I wish I could finish this sermon without it, but I can't. They would tell you, praise the Lord in your sorrows. Praise the Lord when you have trouble in life because the people failed to praise God at the end of this passage. In verse 22, it says, Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the tree, the waters became sweet. Three days after having this great revival of a worship experience among the people, remember there were, there were well over two million people at least, could have been five, four to five or six million people. As they come out of slavery and into freedom, they're worshiping God. Three days later, the scripture says, instead of praising God, they're pouting and they're complaining. Now, before we throw them under the bus, think about that for just a moment. If you hadn't had anything to drink for three days, how would you feel? I'm just saying. If you were out in the desert, out in the wilderness, and you got babies crying after you, wanting something to drink, well, three days into this experience, they forget about the freedom. They, they forget about the deliverance. They forget about the Red Sea. And they start complaining to the Lord. And the complaints are so bad, they named the place after their complaints. They named it Mara, which means bitter. It wasn't called that before this experience. But from here on out, they start calling it Mara, bitter. So let me ask you a question this morning. Are you in a bitter place? Are you living in a bitter place because of something that happened to you in life or something someone did to you or some failed dream that was never realized? And you're still holding on to that and you won't let go of that. 
and you become a bitter person because of it. And I know on this side of it, you say, well, that'll never happen to me. But then you wake up one day and it has. That experience has colored everything that you see. Hebrews 12, 15 says, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble and by it many be defiled. He actually warns us here, warns us about that. You say, what causes that, that root of bitterness that gets lodged in a person's heart and, and really ruins so much of the wonderful life that God has for them? It's spiritual immaturity. Now, I'm sorry if that hurts your feelings, but that, that's what it is. Because God wants to bring you to a place where you can forgive that person who hurt you and release them. You, you, you think you're, you're punishing them by holding on to that? You're not punishing them. You're punishing yourself. Forgive them by the grace of God and release and let that go. And you say, well, how do I do that, Brother Donnie? I've tried that, and it just doesn't seem to work to me. Here's the answer in the text. Go back to praise. Go back to that constant practice of praise in your life. One of the ways you can do that is every day, sometime every day. Spend some time in God's Word and prayer and, this, and make sure that you praise God when you get through asking Him for everything in the world, <laughs> okay? Praise Him. Sometimes I'm guilty of that. I'll finish my prayers and I'll think, oh, Lord, forgive me. I forgot to praise you. I, I forgot to thank you. I gave you my wish list, but I forgot to thank you for what you've already done and praise you for who you are. So spend some time in prayer and in praise every day and then spend some time with God's people every week praising Him. You know, going to church is a habit. It's a good habit. There are not only bad habits in this world. There are some good habits. Brushing your teeth is a good habit. Now, if you haven't brushed your teeth, don't get right up in somebody's face and huff on them before you leave today. All right? Because your breath stinks. It doesn't just stink. It stinks. All right? Brushing your teeth is a good habit. There are a lot of things that are good. And going to church is a good habit. Can I get a witness? We're living in a country that thinks the church is irrelevant. It doesn't matter anymore. Well, it matters for your spirit. It matters for your quality of life. So get up and get in church every week and praise God with his people. And you'll be surprised how it changes how you enjoy what God provides for you every day. The scripture says that Paul had a habit of praising God. There's one instance in Acts chapter 16 Remember when he and Silas were arrested at Philippi for serving the Lord? They cast a demon out of a slave girl. They got arrested and beaten and thrown in jail. And the scripture says in Acts 16, 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. Wow. I just want to be honest with you. I probably wouldn't have done that. I, I probably would have been pouting and whining and complaining and said, hey, anybody got any any uh, antibiotic cream? <laughs> I need some Band-Aids over here. Can somebody help me? Somebody let me out of here. And Lord, if you really love me, why'd you let this happen to me anyway? No, 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 no. Stop and praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Even when things don't seem to go right, even when it seems like you're having problem after problem, you, you try something, it just doesn't work, just praise the Lord anyway. Praise him anyway, because he's worth it. Amen. He's worth it. God has blessed you so much in your life already. He has blessed you so much in your life. If he drew a line in the sand and didn't do anything else for you the rest of your life, that would really be okay because he's done so much for you already. Can, can I get a witness on that? He, he's done so much for you already. So you can always praise him at least for what he has done if you're not aware of what he is doing or what he will do in the years to come. Praise him. Praise him. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Hebrews puts it this way. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. You know, the, the connotation there is of a worship service in a temple. 
and where they'd bring animals and sacrifice them and worship to God. And what the writer here is saying is, you know what kind of offering God wants from you? He wants you to praise Him. Praise Him. And I would dare say if you walk out of this service today and you haven't praised him, you haven't worshipped him. You haven't really worshipped him the way you should have. Praise him because he is worthy to be praised. I listen to a lot of Christian music um, driving down the road and working around the house and different things. Sometimes I can work in, in my office at my desk and have it playing in the background. Zach Williams sings a song called Rescue Story. Have you heard that? Rescue story. It's a powerful song. And the imagery is taken from the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Listen to what it says. He said, You were the voice in the desert, calling me out in the dead of night, fighting my battles for me. You are my rescue story. Lifted me up from the ashes, carried my soul from death to life, bringing me from glory to to glory, you are my rescue story. And then he goes into the refrain, you never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. You never gave up on me. Listen, friend, God never gave up on you. I don't care how far you got away from him or how low you've been or how wicked you've been. He never gave up on you. Praise him. Praise him. Praise Him.